everybody. Welcome to tonight's Greensboro Bound virtual event series. I am Jessica, the program manager. I'm happy to have with us tonight Kathleen Purvis and Daniel Pierce. Kathleen is a three-time James Beard Award nominated author and food journalist with an impressive resume of publications including Our State Magazine, The Charlotte Observer, Garden and Gun, and Southern Living. She also has a book called Distilling the South, A Guide to Southern Craft Liquors and the People Who Make Them. Uh, Kathleen is currently a freelance food journalist, so if anybody out there needs a food writer, Kathleen is your gal. Our guest of honor is Daniel Pierce. His latest work, which we're here to discuss tonight, is titled Tar Heel Lightning, How Secret Stills and Fast Cars Made North Carolina the Moonshine Capital of the World. Daniel has also written several other books, including Real NASCAR, White Lightning, Red Clay, and Big Bill France. He is the interdisciplinary distinguished professor of the Mountain South and resident professional hillbilly, his words, not mine, at University of North Carolina Asheville, where he teaches courses on the South, Appalachia, North Carolina, and national parks. Kathleen and Daniel, I'm so glad to have you guys here with us tonight. So Kathleen, take it away. Hey, how y'all? Happy Friday. It's after five o'clock, as my father always said, after five o'clock somewhere all the time. And uh, they told us to bring drinks. And so what I have brought is some Cherry Bounce from uh, Copper Barrel Distilling in North Wilkesboro. And I have to say it's aged very well. It's very nice. Daniel, what you got? You got some Bounce over there too, man, right? Yeah, I do. This was made for a uh, Vivian Howard event by Gary Cronkleton <laughs> uh, using uh, Howling Moon Moonshine, which is... Uh, made by a UNCA graduate. So um, very partial. Very so. <laughs> well, well let, me, let me tell you a little bit about Daniel and then I'm gonna read a little passage from his book and then I got lots of questions for him. So I first heard about Daniel Pierce from a reliable source, my son. Uh, when my son was a freshman at UNC Asheville, I'd gone over to visit and he was running down the list of the coolest professors on campus and the first that he named was this crazy history professor who was famous on campus because he had the front half of a stock car sticking out of the wall of his office. I believe that was you. <laughs> <laughs> so that crazy history professor was Daniel S. Pierce, who was the author of Real uh, NASCAR, White Lightning, Red Clay, and Big Bill France. He's got North Carolina bona fides. He's also a graduate of Western Carolina University. And he wrote a book on the Great Smoky Mountains. And now he's taken the cork out of the jug on his love of North Carolina's most famous product, corn liquor, among its many names. Welcome, Daniel Pierce. Cherry Bounce cheer to you. All right, thank you, Kathleen, and to you. <laughs> so let me read a little passage that I marked. And you'll, you'll note in my copy of the book, there are a lot of these little orange tags because when I'm reading books, I mark things that interest me. And you can see there's a lot of these little tags here because there was a lot of things in this book I found incredibly interesting. So here's a little passage. Modern day North Carolinians often forget that the state has traditionally been one of the poorest in the nation. Making and selling moonshine often served as the poor person's hedge against desperate economic times and as a supplement to meager farming incomes, even in relatively good times. Distilling, transporting, or selling illegal liquor especially helped provide some level of economic security for North Carolina's most vulnerable populations. These included single women and the African American and Native American victims of the state's oppressive Jim Crow laws. Unfortunately, we will never be able to calculate accurately moonshine's impact on the state economy, but it was almost surely one of the largest industries in the state from the 1860s to the 1960s. The moonshine business also demonstrates the resourcefulness, inventiveness, adaptability, and ingenuity, what historians call agency, of North Carolinians, particularly those on the economic fringes. Indeed, over the years, North Carolinians found a myriad of creative ways to make more illegal liquor quicker, distribute it more effectively, and evade the long reach of law enforcement. So let's talk about this book. 
Now, you're the son of a Southern Baptist minister. Is that right? That's correct, yes. And is that what draws you to the darker sides of <laughs> things like NASCAR and... <laughs> I don't know. You know, it's uh, partly I think it was where I grew up. Uh, I grew up uh, on the west side of Asheville, the, the, the wrong side of the river. And my dad pastored a church there. And it was very blue collar. Uh, there were very few college grads in the, in, in the congregation. Uh, and uh, there were people that worked at the Inca plant and for the phone company and uh, people like that, that I grew up with. And um, so I think my work as a historian is, has long focused on working class. And mm -hmm. so particularly this issue of agency about how people in difficult circumstances find ways to transcend their circumstances or, or, or make do. And, uh, <laughs> and in this case, they literally did make do. <laughs> DBW. <laughs> DBW, not DBW. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, uh, as a way of, of, uh, of coping with their difficult circumstances. And so, um, you know, as the, 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 as the quote said, you know, it was, um, you, you know, it was an insurance policy for some mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. and across so, the board. So which one came first for you, your interest in stock car and NASCAR or your interest in moonshine? Yeah, it was first the interest in stock car racing. And of course that led naturally into the interest in moonshine because the two are, uh, literally joined at the hip and uh uh and so that's where it started and then uh you know i, I started digging deeper into the whole moonshine business because of the interest in nascar mm -hmm. now when i was working on distilling the south one of the things that surprised me um uh, to learn is that there's actually kind of a competition among counties on which one is really the moonshine capital I mean, of all the municipal things you expect counties to brag about, that was not one I expected. So Wilkes, Wilson County, or Johnston County? Which are, yeah, Johnston, Wilkes, or Wilson. Which one of those do you think was the moonshine capital, the closest? Well, depend on what time, uh, what time you're talking about, you know. Well, there's a historian <laughs> answer. <laughs> in terms of, well, you know, and you could throw in lots of other counties. You could throw in Burke County. You could uh, throw in, uh, oh gosh, what's the county where uh, Elizabeth City area is? Uh, oh yeah, that far over, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, uh, Chatham County, you know, mm. <laughs> at one point, you know, was, uh, was definitely a moonshine capital. Madison County, you know, lots of others. But, you know, I think you probably have to, and I had to be real careful in the book, to make sure there wasn't a book about Wilkes County, <laughs> but in terms <laughs> of seriously, yeah, longevity. I yeah. think you know Wilkes County is going to um, uh, win the prize because and the, and the sheer um, amount of activity over yeah, there, yeah. <laughs> and so, the fact that there uh, there are so many. You know, I, I discovered all these Wilkes County people when 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 things got hot in Wilkes County, they went off to Johnston County and other places and <laughs> uh, and made liquor there. So. Well, a Wilson surprised me completely because I lived there till I was ten, and I always thought of it as this kind of genteel little southern town. Yeah. <laughs> and then I found out, in fact, it had a huge reputation of moonshine. Yeah. <laughs> Who knew? And that leads me in my next question, which is, you know, I think most people assume. North Carolina's um, illegal liquor production was focused on the mountains, but that's, it's far more widespread than that in the state, right? Yeah, that was one of the, one of the things I really wanted to uh, do in the book is to show that it's not just because, you know, people always, you know, I mean, the term Mountain Dew, you know, and the, and the, all the connotations with, um, you know, moonshining and a holler somewhere. And, uh, and and people always make that connection, and of course, uh, all the stereotypes you know related to Appalachian culture, you know, are very much featured in the moonshiner. But uh, but in North Carolina, well, well, as I put it, um, um, you know, a swamp's as good as a holler. And um, uh, as far as like hiding something, as far, as, far yeah. as hiding, you need you need water. And you need uh, a place to conceal your steel, which could be in a barn or you know in an underground, uh, you know, cavity of some kind, and uh, and and so you see it in every section of the uh, of the state. You know, the biggest um, steel that was ever busted was in um, uh, Cabarrus County, 
you know, <laughs> you know, not far from uh, Kannapolis, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Conover, uh, Charlotte area, really. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, um, you know, again, it's all over the state. Uh, and in literally, I think I had plenty of, of evidence from every county in the state. Yeah, it's funny. When I was, um, I was at Broad Slab Distilling in Johnston County, and he, it's a farm-based distillery. He learned from his grandfather, who apparently once upon a time, that was the main road to the beach. And so they had a produce stand, and you stopped and bought your cantaloupes and, you know, your watermelon and a jar of shine to take with you to the beach. And one of the things he was telling me was that that section of Johnston County, apparently the soil is very sandy there, and that filtered the water. So they had this exceptionally good water in that one area of the state, far from the mountains where, you know, that all area is known for wa good quality water. So, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't have guessed that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so you introduced me to a couple of new words that I want to ask you to explain to me. I had never heard the word blockade. I mean, obviously I knew the word blockade. I know what a blockade is, but I didn't know it was connected to liquor. So can you explain that word to us? Yeah, blockade so this was, right, this was the, uh, the term that was commonly used up to around uh, 1900. Uh, you know, if you go back and you look at uh, newspaper accounts about, you know, what we generally refer to as moonshiners, you know, they will um, use the term blockader or, or, or running the blockade. Uh, and it goes back to that whole notion of um, of um, uh, evading law enforcement, you know, to um, to deliver a product to market. And so it was picked up. And of course, it kind of adds some romance to the whole thing. And, and, and there was a real connotation in the early days to kind of defiance of the federal government, of the Yankee federal government that was very much attached. So the term blockade was the one that was adopted and used very commonly, um, again, into the 20th century, but was the most common term used. It, it was connected to the Civil War, wasn't yeah. it? Yes. Yes. So, you know, Rhett Butler was a blockade. Right, runner. right. exactly. Right. So yeah. that was part of it was the defiance of an evading force that you considered not having the right to stop you, but also that romance of taking a high risk to get something through. Exactly. Yeah, I was, I had never heard that one before. And yet when you were quoting from the old newspaper accounts, I noticed it over and over and over again. The other one I was real curious about is red-legged grasshopper. Okay. <laughs> Explain well, to us what a red-legged grasshopper is. Okay, well, um, one of the things that um, uh, in the early days of, you know, what makes, um, this liquor illegal was, uh, people think prohibition, but it was initially the federal excise tax, which still is still there. And so it, that's, it's always a violation of the federal excise tax. And so uh, when the federal government started enforcing that uh, after the Civil War, during the Reconstruction era, this became a very much a political issue. And so the Republicans, um, the if, if, um, revenue agent was a patronage position. And so these were appointed by Republican office holders and they were Republican, loyal Republicans themselves. So the Democrats used this very much against, they very much sided with the moonshiner. And Zeb Vance, uh, who I think most North Carolinians are familiar with and kind of controversially now and, and of course, there were two big issues that helped to um, uh, bring the Democrats back into power. One was the race issue um, and, uh, you know, uh, the white supremacy issue, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. I guess I think was mm -hmm. a key issue. But almost as important was the liquor issue. Uh, and, the, um, and the promise that the Democrats always made was that they were going to disband the um, Internal Revenue Service and in the liquor tax, which they, when Grover Cleveland got elected uh, first Democrat in a long time, they didn't do because they were too dependent on the revenue. But Zeb Vance used this as a campaign issue to, to get elected. And that was his favored term for revenue agents were red-legged grasshoppers that were, uh, you know, kind of destroying the fruit of the land. You know, here's something that was, you know, a, a natural part of, 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 
of life for so many farmers. And here these people were coming in and, uh, you know, like a plague of locusts and mm -hmm. And so, uh, so he, he, he uh, loved that term. And actually you see it in North Carolina again, well into the early part of the 20th century, people are still referring to revenue agents as red-legged grasshoppers. Yeah, there was, there was a, um, a, a political cartoon you had in the book that showed a, a locust or a grasshopper. And what made me laugh was that he was carrying a carpet bag. Yes. Thought, well, well, that's not very subtle now, is it? Yeah. Well, it's all tied to the you know, <laughs> Republican Party and the politics of the day. You know, uh -huh. very effective, very effective. It was effective. Now, what, one thing I thought was the most, was really, really interesting to me is this idea that early on making liquor wasn't illegal. What was illegal was not paying the taxes on it. So, you know, before prohibition, it was an important part of the rural economy. So can you talk a little bit about the years before liquor became an illegal thing to produce to drink and was a farm product? I mean, this is the whiskey rebellion goes back to all of this. Yeah, so um, before the Civil War, it was perfectly legal to make liquor. And, um, and so many farmers uh, and plantations as well. That was one of the really surprising things that I found were how many plantations had distilleries mm -hmm. operated by slaves. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, but, but, you know, most farms had a small distillery and, uh, and they would use this to supplement their income as a way to pay their taxes. Um, when the excise tax comes in and after the civil war, you could still make it as long as you paid the tax. Now, the problem was for most small scale producers, which most North, Carolini, uh, North Carolinians were, um, you couldn't make any profit off of it. You know, the, the tax, paying the tax would just eat up all your profit. So mm -hmm. there were large distilleries though that continued to operate up until prohibition. So it's perfectly legal um, uh, if you paid the tax after the civil war. Um, mm -hmm. But again, most North Carolinians just there, I mean, uh, they needed the income because life was very difficult on the farm. It was hard to make a living, uh, particularly if you want to pay your taxes. It, it's, it's, there's, there's a big irony here in terms of uh, what's going on here is that people are defying a tax in order to pay a tax. So they're defying the federal tax in order to pay their property tax. Um, and, and that was a key way of doing that, of, of mm -hmm. holding on to your land. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things I always thought was interesting was, you know, before corn liquor became the dominant thing, you know, making, making brandy from fruit was very much a home-based thing. And, and usually the farm wives were the ones who were involved in that, right? Because, you know, that's part of the cycle of the farm is you're, you're creating corn that's much too heavy to move within, you know, efficiently. And so if you grind it up and you ferment it and you distill it, you end up with something that's a lot more portable. And if you got way too much fruit coming in, uh, you know, fruit always tends to come in all at once, you can ferment it, you can make something that'll keep you warm and, you know, cure your cough and <laughs> make your children happy all through the winter. So, you know, I'm, I'm always fascinated by that sort of perfection of the farm economy. Yeah. Um, involved in liquor. Well, it was, and, and, you know, it's really interesting uh, wherever you see um, a, a friend of mine is the uh, site manager for the Vance birthplace. And she was talking to me uh, and she was talking about um, Robert Vance, who was uh, uh, Zeb Vance's uncle who owned the property there, um, had a large peach orchard. And so, and this is like in the 1830s. Mm -hmm. um, and I go, oh, okay, well, I know what that was for. And because there wasn't any reason to have a large orchard uh, unless you're distilling. Right. Because it's going to go bad before you can get it to market and make anything off of it. But again, the profit is really in making brandy. And so uh, um, there was a lot, lot, and actually this continued really, you know, into the 20th century. There are places that were known for their uh, apple brandy, peach brandy, and uh, mm -hmm. Uh, and about anything, any fruit you could distill, uh, you know, people would do it, you know. Yeah, uh, when you go up to George Washington's distillery at Mount Vernon, 
uh, there's a list of the brandies. And one of the ones he was making was apparently persimmon brandy. Yes. Which I had never heard of. But if you ever want to tour a really old wood fired operation where they truly show you how much labor went into making it in there in Virginia, it was rye whiskey, not, you know, corn whiskey so much. But it's a great place to take kids because the mill is fascinating. <laughs> it's a wonderful well, that, also, that also points to the really important thing that it wasn't just all over North Carolina, but it's, it, it's across every demographic group in the state. And so, uh, you know, these African-Americans who made liquor as slavery took those skills into freedom. Mm -hmm. And it's an important way for them as well. The, uh, the Lumbee, uh, in particular, were very much big in the moonshine business. Uh, and actually, it was African Americans. The original moonshiners in North Carolina were African Americans and Native Americans mm -hmm. because there was a state law passed in the 1830s which made it illegal for, for free persons of color to make liquor. And so they started defying the law uh, in the 1830s. And wow. so they are really the original moonshiners in North Carolina. No kidding. That's really interesting, especially now that we're finally uncovering so much more about who did what. And, you know, in Kentucky, they're finally giving more credit um, to the African-Americans who the enslaved people who were the, the base of that business. Yeah. And you see that same story. Um, Percy Flowers, who's maybe the most famous. I was, was going to get to Percy. Here. Yeah, I love that. North story. Carolina, but he learned the craft from an African-American distiller uh -huh. in Johnson County that he kind of apprenticed with, and then he, he took over the business. Uh, yeah, I was gonna get that, you bring me to another question I had, which is that one of my favorite things in this book is that you set up the idea of a North Carolina hall of fame and shame of the most important players in the history of moonshine in North Carolina. And, you know, the diversity in there is fascinating. There are, there are historical figures. There are quite a few women in there, I noticed some scrappy ones. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and there is at least one black man, um, Howard Creech, um, which yeah. I had I had never been aware of Howard Creech. Can you tell us a little bit about him? Yeah, Howard Creech, um, the way that, um, in, and again, the numbers of African Americans who are involved in the moonshine business is huge, particularly in the eastern part of the state. And uh, Howard, and, and it really operated, um, really like the sharecropping system, or it really was a sharecropping system. And so you would have a white owner uh, and they would supply the steel, the supplies, um, bail you out of jail, provide you with a lawyer, all kinds of stuff you got caught. They themselves rarely went to the steel, they stayed away from it. And then the African-Americans, um, you know, made the liquor, distributed the liquor, took all the risk. Uh -huh and got a little bit out of it, you know, while the Percy Flowers of the industry are making millions uh, uh, a year. So Howard Creech was Percy Flowers' right-hand man, basically, for years and years. He started working for Percy when he was in his, you know, early teens. Yeah, and, and he didn't uh, die that long ago. Right, right, it wasn't that long ago. Yeah, it was like 2013, I think you said, was when he died, I was very surprised. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. he must have been a very elderly gentleman, because, you know, he goes back to the 30s when right. he started doing this. Right. Either that or it's very good for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's some people that argue that. So. <laughs> now, okay, so we talked about the farm economy and the history of this. You write that prohibition was actually the best thing that could have happened to Moonshine. Oh, absolutely. I mean, because the demand never goes away, you know, <laughs> as much as the prohibitionists uh, kept arguing that it would, but the demand never went away. So all they do, uh, all prohibition does is eliminate the legal operators. And so, um, and so it just, it, it, and it, the prices go up dramatically. I wondered, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, and and, and when you get to national prohibition, I mean the price is skyrocketed. I mean that's just incredible because North Carolina has this great reputation, as you know, going back into the 1870s, you know, Harper's Magazine and places like this for making great moonshine, and so um, and so you you know you're you're distributing nationally at that point, 
and uh, and again, the profits are just incredible at that point. So it, it kept a lot of people in business for a long time. And of course, in North Carolina, people think about prohibition. They think in national prohibition. Prohibition starts in North Carolina. There's a referendum in, in 1908. Mm -hmm. the effect in 1909, so 11 years before national prohibition, North Carolina is dry. Uh, and actually, you had dry counties before that. Mm -hmm. Then when national prohibition ends in 1933, most of North Carolina remains dry well into the 1960s or 1970s. I mean, we still have some dry counties in North Carolina. Yeah, we do. And that, that always surprises me across the South. I think Mississippi, they didn't lift prohibition until 1966. Yeah. You know, I don't think people realized how long right. it lasted across yeah. the South. Yeah. Yeah. And, which is why moonshine persists as long as it did, because <laughs> it's the Baptists that are making it last so long, you know. Well, that was a, there was another person that came up in your hall of shame and a, and a phrase that I wanted to, to get you to talk a little bit about. And it's funny because it was something that I only thought of as having to do with South Carolina. And that is Lewis Redmond and the Dark Corner, which I don't think most people know what the Dark Corner was but it was, it kind of almost overlapped with North Carolina, didn't it? Yeah, so that little point of South Carolina is called the Dark Corner, and part of the reason it was called that was because of Lewis Redman and his kingdom really there, but Lewis Redman was a North Carolinian. He was from Transylvania County, and uh, he grew up, um, you know, his family made liquor as part of their farm activities, and then after the war, they kept making liquor, and then uh, he was accosted on the way to market one time with a wagon load of liquor by a revenue agent, and they ended up uh, having a shootout, and Redmond killed him, and then he goes across the border into South Carolina, but he ends up kind of having this, uh, uh, really almost keen, he had a gang, and I mean, they, they just terrorized the revenue agents in that area, but he became very popular. Wade Hampton the governor of South Carolina, you know, was a big, was a big supporter of, uh, hey, Lydia. <laughs> <laughs> I hope she's not making comments on your, on your back. She's judgment. actually quoting my mother. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was always considered a Robin Hood like character. Oh, absolutely. I mean, he was profiled in the New York Times. Yeah, and, I think uh, they Mount uh, written about him. Yeah, he was a huge celebrity. I mean, he was really, probably the first uh, celebrity moonshiner. You know, which there have been a number of North Carolinians who would fit that bill. And so then he eventually brought to justice, you know, or, or he had, had a shootout. He, he, he goes into Swain County uh, to, uh, because things got too hot in South Carolina and has a shootout, gets wounded and then uh, captured and, and, and sent off to the uh, federal penitentiary in Albany. But he's pardoned by Chester Arthur. And has well, an awful return to South Carolina. But ironically, doesn't he end up making legal liquor on behalf of the state of South Carolina? Yes, yeah, in South <laughs> Carolina. <laughs> yeah, South me about his story. yeah, and his pictures on the bottle. And actually, yeah. now there is a legal moonshine. There is, yeah, the, uh, six and twenty is it? I believe in I'm, uh, I'm Greenville, sure there, South Carolina. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so that with Lewis Redmond's picture on the box. Yeah, yeah, they all kind of compete to claim like links to Lewis Redmond. Um, one of the distilleries down there claims that they are the descendants of Lewis Redmond, which okay. I thought was really interesting. <laughs> um, so legal moonshine now is where we are now, mostly. <laughs> well, <laughs> there is some legal, legal still out there, from what I hear, but um, but it's created quite a tourist industry. Um, one of the things I've had pushback from liquor fans in writing my book on distilling, you know, distilleries across the South is whether or not legal moonshine can be called moonshine. Yeah. Well, um, you know, there's an old saying, you know, if it's legal, it ain't moonshine. Well, exactly. <laughs> that it's, that it's unaged corn whiskey. It, you're right, right, right. It's corn liquor, uh, but it's not moonshine because it's legal. You know, mm -hmm. and by very definition of moonshine, you know, it's made in the light of the moon, you know, to evade uh, detection and law enforcement and all that. But, uh, but you know, I, I generally cut people some slack there, you know, if they're uh, uh, making a genuine corn article, okay, we can call it mm -hmm. moonshine. You know? mm -hmm. Or like, you know, something like this, 
Now she started, this is Troy and Sons from Asheville. And is it, is it Troy Ball? Is that her name? Yeah, it's Troy Ball. Yeah. 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 She started out being fascinated. She came to the town, to Asheville. Um, she'd had trouble. One of her sons had some pretty terrible health problems. Her life was not real great. And her neighbors started giving her a moonshine. And some of it was actually very good. And she started, you know, getting so interested in it. She and her sons ended up opening a distillery and now she's aging in barrels. So at least it does have some color and some age on it. You know, we're seeing a lot of that kind of thing going on across the state. Broad Slab's doing that. Yeah. Um, do you see, is there anything out there that really interests you in, in what's being made across the state now? Do you ever get out there and try some of them? Yeah, uh, you know, not, not so my, much my mother knows, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's really interesting. And, and I, you know, it was really funny because doing that last chapter of the book, I just could not keep up, you know, <laughs> because yeah. every time I write it there, you know, two more would open. Somewhere. I had the same problem. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I think I even say in the book that, you know, it's only in these key counties, you know, Burke County doesn't have one. Well, now they do, you know, <laughs> South Mountain yeah. Distillery, you know, which they should, you know, <laughs> but a lot of them do play on the heritage and a lot of them are family connected. Um, uh, I have to give, um, you know, uh, shout out to Cody Bradford, who's my, my former student, uh, who, who, and UNC Asheville grad, um, who makes it here in Asheville. And he, he goes back probably five generations. Really? Uh, yeah. And Cody has a relatively small operation, although he stays really busy. Um, I, everything I know about making moonshine, I learned from Cody, but he, he, he makes it in, in something you would recognize as a still. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the fancier ones, you know, like Troy, you know, and she makes a good product, but she, it, it's a German built. Yeah. A limbic still. Yeah. One of the really know, big. Column, yeah. yeah. Column still. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Cody, you know, makes it, uh, you know, his stills look like stills. And so, but you see a lot of family connections in there. You see uh, uh, the Call family. I was going to say the Call. Uh, well, yeah. And uh, this, this I, I can't remember the guy's name, the Broad Slab, you know, that's a, you know, his is a long family tradition. And so you see that, and actually a number of these, you see that family tradition. Uh, although the very first one uh, was a, uh, that was uh, made Piedmont Distillers, the first one in North Carolina, uh, Moonshine Distillery. Uh, he was, uh, I think, from New Jersey or somewhere, New York or somewhere like that. I think was the advertising executive with R.J. Reynolds, and then went into the moonshine business. So, but then he got Junior. Then he signed up Junior Johnson for uh -huh, uh -huh. Midnight Moon, and so that kind of gave him more legitimacy, I guess. And yeah, and, uh, in that. So one of the things I have to, to confess is um, uh, you and I probably had the same editor at UNC Press. Was Elaine Maisner your editor? No, Mark Simpson boss. Mark, okay. Mm -hmm. Elaine Maisner is the editor in a lot of the food books. And I had done, you know, two books in the Savor the South series, including this one on bourbon. Um, notice how I slipped that in. Uh, <laughs> and Elaine called me up and wanted me to do something more on whiskey because she said, you know, you're actually good on whiskey. And I thought, well, that. People have always said that. Get a few <laughs> drinks in me and I'm easier. Um, but I had to tell her, she wanted me to do something on craft distilling. And I said, you know, that'd be great, but so much of what I've encountered in craft distilling at that point was legal moonshine. And honest to God, I hated moonshine. Yeah. It is hard stuff to drink. And bad moonshine is not pleasant at all. I did eventually find a moonshine I really liked. And that is, you know, Copper Barrel out of North Wilkesboro. They are using the steam method that you talked about that's very um, peculiar to that area. Um, and they make a much smoother product. But I also have to say that the worst thing I tasted on the entire, you know, 54 distilleries that I went to for that book was a moonshine distillery in South Carolina, not far from the dark corner. And unfortunately, they were flavoring their moonshine. And one of the flavors was salted caramel moonshine, which is something I don't believe anyone should ever have in yeah. their mouth, much less their head. <laughs> try to get rid of it, try to get rid of it. Um, so what did, could you tell me about like the best you had and the worst you had 
in, in your history of researching all of this? Well, I can tell you the best I've had. And it's, uh, I don't know whether I should say it in public or not. But anyway. <laughs> so, I had a student that came up to me one day and she said, Dr. Pierce, she said, you won't believe what my crazy roommates are doing. And I said, what? <laughs> He said, they built a still in the backyard shed and they're making liquor. And I said, oh, I said, well, you know, it's going to be horrible, you know, because most people, you know, and I've heard so many stories, people try to make it, they get some, something off the internet, you know, and they get some recipes off the internet and then they're making it with, you know, I've even heard of people trying to make it with uh, frozen uh, corn. You know, oh God, no! You know, and it just turned. It's horrible, you know. And so, uh, and so, I said, it, you know, it's going to be horrible. And so, anyway, we have our our banquet every year uh, for the history department at the governor's western residence. Most people don't know there's such a thing, but there's a house up on Sunset Mountain above Asheville that's owned by the state and uh, was donated to the state actually to get the governor to Western North Carolina and remember that we're, we're there and part of the state. But anyways, but they let nonprofits uh, have their events there. And so we have our event there. And so we're cleaning up in the kitchen after the event. And the student comes up to me with a little bag and says, I've got something for you. And so there was a little jar in there. And so I opened I, and I, I was dreading it because I knew it was going to be so bad and everything. And I sipped that and it was incredible. It was really? so smooth. It was just, and, and it just had, you know, just the right balance. I mean, you had the corn taste. It was just, it was perfect. And so I called my our assistant in the department who's uh, from old fort and she's had a lot of moonshiners in her family in fact her husband makes it but uh, <laughs> but uh, i'm outing him here on this but anyway i said actually get over here try this and so she tasted it she got her husband over we got um ellen pearson one of my colleagues is a big single malt scotch snob and everything i said ellen taste this and she thought it was good, you know, and so we're passing this around and all of a sudden it dawns on me that we're passing illegal liquor around. <laughs> made by students, no yeah, problem. made by students. <laughs> but that's probably the best I've ever had. I mean, it was just straight up moonshine, you know. Oh, damn. <laughs> that's impressive. I've had some really good apple pie in my time. Uh, mm, yeah, that's the, it does take to being flavored, like the cherry bounce. Yeah. Which, you know, they, they warned me not to eat any of the cherries. Yeah. That's apparently a very bad thing to do. <laughs> I've never heard that because I've eaten them. <laughs> oh, you have? Oh, okay. They will. They will. Um, yeah. They hold a lot of liquor, aren't they? <laughs> so. <laughs> well, maybe it's time for me to get to the bottom of that bottle <laughs> so right. you know, I can put them in my Manhattans for the next little while. Oh, yeah. There you go. Yeah. So you got anything else you want to add that I haven't remembered to ask you? Where else we want to go before we see if there's any questions from people? Well, I, did, I, I guess just to mention the role of women uh, quickly. Uh, because Thank you. To, Always happy to hear more about that. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it, it really was an eye opener uh, as I really got into the newspapers. And, and there have been a few mentions, just a few small mentions in the literature. Um, uh, Elizabeth Engelhardt at Chapel Hill had written a chapter in, in um, her book, A Mess of Greens, uh, about women and moonshine. And But most of her examples were from fiction. Huh. Uh, but then I started, when I got into the newspapers, I mean, it was just like over and over and over and over these fascinating stories about, about women and uh, you know, and, and, and it's a really interesting thing that you have for women uh, it, again, it's this insurance policy, uh, but for so many uh -huh. women, it's a situation to where, particularly if they don't have male supporters, um, if they're if, if they're single women, if they're widows, if they're uh, been abandoned by their husbands, there, there's really an acceptance in a lot of rural areas that that women will either make or particularly sell, operate what they call a shot house. Uh, and out of their house. And this is very common, particularly in the African-American community, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the, uh, among the Lumbee, but all over the state. Yeah, I didn't know about the Lumbee uh, connection until I read your book. I, was, yeah. I thought I knew all about this subject because I didn't <laughs> have to do a lot of research 
when I was doing my own book, because there are so many moonshine distilleries out there in the craft world now, but man, you, you took it some places I had not heard yeah. that, are, that made a really good story. Um, and in fact, here's a question from one person that we didn't really touch on that much. And that is, you know, how does NASCAR come out of the moonshine world? Yeah, well, direct. Can you, can you give us a quick rundown on that, <laughs> yeah, literally? Yeah, I, I mean, the, the big thing with NASCAR, um, and, and people know generally the idea that the earliest drivers who became NASCAR stars uh, were um, uh, Lee Petty. I mean, mm -hmm. people, the, the Petty family only recently has admitted that Lee Petty hauled lick or Curtis Turner, Bonnie Flock, uh, Bob Flock. I mean, you go on and on and on uh, with the names of those early drivers who were all involved in the illegal liquor business. As I put it, they got their first high speed driving experience, you know, behind the wheel of a liquor car. But the important thing too, beyond that is that uh, the illegal liquor business really financed early NASCAR. And it was um, the uh, car owners, the track owners, the promoters, the mechanics, everybody was, was tied up in the illegal liquor business. So, so the whole thing is really um, a product. NASCAR doesn't like to talk about it. You know, they'll talk <laughs> about a few drivers. They'll say, yeah, there's Junior Johnson, you know. And of course, he, you know, he, he spent almost a year in the Chillicothe, Ohio Federal Penitentiary, you know. But, but it's the... Um, um, you know, it's those track owners, it's those promoters that, that were so important that were right in there partnering with Bill France, who's the head of NASCAR, you know, and France always acted like he never knew anything about that, but he was busy <laughs> partners with these people. He had to know where their money was coming from. So, uh -huh. but, um, but yeah, the, the important early tracks were all built by, by uh, big time, bootleggers in North Carolina, including North Wilkesboro and um, mm -hmm. Hillsboro track um, uh, near, near Durham uh, and Hickory and uh, the Asheville Weaver Mill Speedway. These were all the um, most important tracks in the early days of NASCAR and um, the Charlotte Speedway where the very first NASCAR race was held. <laughs> not, we call it the Lowe's Motor Speedway. <laughs> well, not, it's not the same track. This is one Oh, of the I see. You're talking about the, the Forerunner. Okay. Right, okay. right, right. So, so uh, but that one has some ties because Curtis Turner built that and he was a big time uh, a moonshiner back in the day as well. So, uh -huh. all sorts of connections in those mm -hmm. days. So not just the driving and not just the way they stripped the cars down. No, and no, 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 no. Souped yeah. them up so that, you know, but always used an old body so you didn't know. Yeah, right. yeah. So we have another question. Um, what is the earliest year you know of moonshining in North Carolina? And what types of records did you use to learn about the history? Yeah, so, um, well, it goes back, you know, again, 1862 is when the federal excise tax is passed as a wartime measure. Mm -hmm. And of course, North Carolina had seceded, so it didn't exactly apply. So it took a few years after the war before, and the federal government, you know, had to kind of tread lightly, you know, uh, in terms of enforcing. But by the late 1860s, um, one of the first cases I came across actually was an interesting one. It was Amos Owens, who was uh, called the Cherry Bounce King out of uh, Rutherford County, and uh, and he got busted and the uh, and they sold his still on the steps of the courthouse and uh, and he had been a big time legal producer before the war, uh, but uh, he was one of the first. So in the late eighteen sixties. And then really stepping up in the 1870s, early 1880s, and what they called the Moonshine Wars, particularly in Western North Carolina. Um, and so uh, there are a number of things. Uh, for one, you know, one of the nice things when you have uh, a federal agency, you know, they tend to keep good records. And so you have the records of uh, what's originally called the ATU, the Alcohol Tax Unit, and now it's mm -hmm. alcohol firearms, tobacco, explosives, and whatever else, you know, uh, that type of thing. And the, the name changes over the years, but there, there are always records. And that's kind of what I base my whole thing about North Carolina being the moonshine capital of the world, because um, 
North Carolina is at or near the top every year, pretty much in terms of the number of steals uh, uh, busted, uh, the number of people arrested, um, all kinds of statistics that the um, um, that the Treasury Department, uh, that that arm of the Treasury Department that's in charge of this. Um, uh, kept and so that was a, b a big part and then the newspaper we got a wonderful thing in terms of historical research in recent years called newspapers.com which it's just in and there are other newspaper da databases as well that you can actually search and yeah, so like Texas Lexus and you know yeah yeah but yeah. you can find so much that you it, you know it would have taken me 20 or it, it would have taken me the rest of my life to do the kind of research just scrolling through microfilm Mm -hmm. um, you know, but, but you can just go in and put search, you can put moonshine in or whatever, you know, or blockade or whatever. And then you get all these results. And so I found out so much, um, uh, through that newspaper research as well. And then you got a lot of, um, oral histories, um, cause people have always been interested in moonshine. There's just a real fascination with the topic and, uh, and the, and, and the figures are so, interesting in many ways and mm -hmm. colorful and people always wanted to uh, write about these people. Yeah, you've got some great pictures, especially those Hall of Fame entries on, <laughs> on some of these guys. Uh, one of the stills that you mentioned, um, there actually was a still known as the Bobby Burns still. This is, do you remember this? It yeah, was I, I remember it was, yeah, that was mentioned in a newspaper that supposedly Robert Burns was a, what they call a gauger. Uh, and he was um, essentially Robert Burns as in the Scottish poet. Right, right, right. yeah. And so, uh, and, and and so, this was supposedly a still that he had confiscated in Scotland, and that somehow found its way to North Carolina, <laughs> and was still making moonshine. I think in this is the eight, well, maybe early twentieth century. I think. And then it was, it was captured and then they supposedly put it in the state museum, you know, and I asked some friends of mine, you know, at the, at the <laughs> state, you know, with the archives and history and with the uh, state museum, if they knew anything about this and they, uh, they did. And so I never found any real confirmation that. Don't you, don't you had like, you could picture the, the Raiders of the Lost Ark thing scene where you're walking <laughs> through the boxes and there's Robert Burns is still locked up in there somewhere. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I guess it's a possibility, you know, given the Scottish immigration, you know, the Highland Scott immigration uh, to yeah. the and, region. So, you know, the, in uh, Kentucky, one of the things, the, the Bean, the people, the forerunners of the Bean family, the Jim Bean family, their early name was Bohm. It was, you know, the German spelling. And allegedly one of their ancestors went through the Cumberland Gap with a still on his back is the story they always tell, that it was, you know, if you're getting ready to head back up into the wilderness, what do you need? You're gonna take your still. Yeah. <laughs> I've also heard that, because, and tell me if this is true, or if you've heard this, that copper doesn't rust away. So you can still, way back up in the woods, find the ring remaining of old copper stills. Yeah. And that's, yeah, that's, so that's true. Because I've heard people tell me that and I thought, well, that can't possibly be, but. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no well, reason, you, know. you really don't find much copper because copper was too valuable and people uh -huh. use it. So they didn't leave it behind much, you know. Yeah. But you find are some old galvanized steel barrels a lot of times, but. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and I remember as a kid in Wilson, um, this would have been 65, 66. <clears throat> they used to actually have public service announcements on TV. A, you know, along the lines of don't drink that, you'll go blind. And they would always show this footage of like people making liquor in, in car radiators yeah. and, you know, horrible equipment with, made with lead. And, you know, those were PSAs in Eastern yeah. North Carolina. Well, there was a <laughs> major campaign. <laughs> yeah, in the 50s and 60s, one of the most effective campaigns was a public health campaign. And the thing that kind of gave that more oomph, I guess you would say, with the fact that you had in the Triangle area um, uh, several cases of, of, of bad liquor that was run through, through galvanized uh, steel and the lead salts leached out and you had mm -hmm. several deaths and 
you know, people going blind and all kinds of stuff. And so that really, mm -hmm. uh, that had a big impact, you know, there. And so, and actually I've got, actually found one of these on eBay. <laughs> they had these, um, the um, ATF, I guess uh, they were at that time, produce some, you know, like uh, the funeral home fans. Oh, uh-huh. Yeah, you know, that said moonshine kills and it has somebody laying on their back, you know, holding Oh, I, I won. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a picture of it in the book there. <laughs> But, uh, I collect folding fans like a good yeah. southern woman. Well, it's not a folding, it's, it was a card. <laughs> yeah, I know it was. Yeah. But, uh, Funeral but, fans, uh, man, I love them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that would be a good thing to have. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we got any other questions? I think we're coming up on a couple of minutes to go here. Um, I know that uh, Greensboro Bound wanted to come back and do a little talk for the things they need to tell you. Do we have any more questions, Jessica? I don't think so. I don't see anything. Uh, thank well, you everybody for coming and for and also remind people this book. Yes, is there's available. A book. Independent bookstores all over the state are standing by the phones waiting to order right. this for you. Absolutely. Oh <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much, Kathleen and Daniel. I uh, really appreciate both of you being here with us tonight. Uh, this was a really fun, entertaining conversation uh, to listen in on. So thank you guys so much. Uh, to our audience, thank you guys as well for coming to support uh, Greensboro Bound. Uh, things have been crazy, you know, we never imagined that we would be online, you know, when we were planning our festival back in January. We certainly thought we'd see Daniel in person in May, uh, but well, you know, life had other plans. Um, <clears throat> so. We're really thankful that we've been able to continue our events online. Um, and it's really through our audience members, folks who are passionate about books and reading and writing who make all of this possible. Um, so if you'd like to help us continue, there's actually a couple of things that you can do to continue to support Greensboro Bound. Um, first off, absolutely please follow us on social media. We're on Facebook uh, and Instagram predominantly. We also have a Twitter account. Uh, we also have a really robust website. <clears throat> excuse me and so all of our events are always posted across those platforms you can also sign up for our mailing list and share those with your friends if you see a topic that you think would be of interest um, the second thing which is really perhaps uh, one of the most important for our, our, our financial help is you can donate to Greensboro Bound it doesn't have to be a lot but every little bit counts I promise you everything counts to be able to allow us to continue doing this work um, and all of our events are completely free to our audience. They're completely free to our community. And we can really only do that with your gifts and your, you know, the kindness of your financial contributions. Um, and one final thing in that regard is if you do have the ability to be a sustainer, I know we're all familiar probably with the uh, like WNC and WFDD with their sustainer drives. So we all know what sustainers are, but those are givers who give a little each month uh, to kind of help us throughout the year. Um, if you have the ability to do that, <clears throat> we absolutely would love for you to do that as well. Um, or a one-time gift is fine. Whatever you can do. So thanks again to Kathleen and Daniel for being here with us tonight. Uh, I haven't had my drink yet, but I'm going to go fix me one right now because uh, I've had my dinner. And so yeah, I just uh, had one person post that they're all too drunk for more questions. <laughs> All right, I can see that, especially if they went by the liquor store and picked up some real moonshine. I, I imagine they probably are a little, um, a little, a, a little past at this point. So um, thank you, everybody. Please, again, keep an eye on our social media. We do have another event next week. <laughs> and then we've got even more coming up for the fall. Um, we're going to be here virtually uh, as long as we need to be. And so, you know, keep coming back for more. Uh, next Thursday, we have our last Crimson Letters event if you've been following those, um, but check out our website, greensboroboundcom for all the information on that. So, all right, thank you again to Kathleen and Daniel. I really appreciate your time. Those of you at home, thank you as well. Um, and everybody, I know we're not drinking and driving tonight, so, you know, if you can, <laughs> go have another one, and we'll see you next week. Happy, you guys. Weekend, happy Friday. And thank right. you, Daniel, for, for being such a good sport with all my questions. I always well, enjoy you, it. Kathleen, I appreciate it. It's fun. All right. Bye, y'all.